um, yeah, I, I just wanted to start by saying um, I really appreciated your talk, Kevin, because it kind of helped put some pieces together for me that I've been sort of trying to work out. And uh, so first of all, I, uh, I'm really kind of a hybrid. When you talked about the University of Toronto, <laughs> <laughs> that's me. <laughs> um, and I really found my, my way with uh, electroacoustic music at McGill. Because before, um, when I was here studying at U of T, I was going crazy, and then I went up to York, and I studied with Jim Tenney, and that was still all acoustic music. And um, in fact, I had a really hard time with electronic music at the time. I don't know why, but then all of a sudden, I had a baby. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I decided I would go and study electronic music. I had no idea what motivated me to do that. <laughs> so I went to the uh, conservatory, and um, there I found this whole world. It was very antiquated there at the time. It was a, I don't know, some sort of pin thing. What was this thing called? Yeah, Cynthia, AKS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, oscillators and tape loops. And I suddenly found my way with uh, some tools and some instruments that allowed me to explore this whole sound world that I hadn't. Well, it really wasn't a sound world. What it was is a conceptual world of, of my politics, which at the time was feminism. And so, and it was sort of in the burgeoning days of feminism um, in the early 80s. Oh, I guess, yeah. And, but really, I started exploring all these texts, and I constructed all these pieces. And the first piece was called Mi Homo, which is which is Greek for against men. <laughs> 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 so that was my first piece. <laughs> and um, and then so then but then I, I was really like I got I got to pursue this. So I went to McGill, um, and I at the time I had no idea. I thought I'm going to study electronic music there. And when I got there in 82, they had just bought a Synclavier system, which was pre-MIDI, pre-whatever. And, um, and I just fell in love with it, and I started doing all these pieces. And the piece I want to play for you now is, is called Rising Tides of Generations Lost, which actually won the Kevin Austin Award <laughs> <laughs> at the time. I think that was the first year they gave out that award. Am I, am I right? What? Did, is there not a Kevin Austin? No, that's no? G, that was the original, the origin of JTTP. Oh. JTTP was formed, was set up in 1981, 82, 83. This was in 84. Yeah, it was set up at that time. It just became impossible to do because it was all done on tape. And so we only ran it for about four years. And what, then you only ran what for four years? There was the, a, the award? a competition that ran for four years. Well, it was, no, it was just within McGill. It was McGill students. No? Okay. It, wasn't well, we, with, it wasn't just with it, your students. Well, it, what, oh, anyway. Oh, that's another thing. Okay, yeah. That's so that's anyway, I won this award <laughs> <laughs> for this piece called Rising Times of Generations Lost. And at the time, I was really inspired by this book by Susan Griffin called Women and Nature, The Roaring Inside Her. And what she did basically is contextualize the female voice in italics um, in the midst of this kind of this sort of document of the, tr the history of uh, Western intellectual history and philosophical history. And the fact that women's voices were, you know, trying, silenced and emerged and so on. So I took some of that text and I um, made this piece. And, uh, but really the Synclavier, what it did for me was it brought together, it was monophonic sampling. And in fact, it, the only way of, uh, documenting or recording it, this was to dump it onto a multi-track tape deck, and then so I got into that and doing um, and FM synthesis, which I think was the beauty of that instrument is that it could combine both of these things. And for me, I don't know, my ears, I still love the sound of FM synthesis coming from the synclavier <laughs> <laughs> above anything else. <laughs> um, anyway, so this piece um, is a little bit of a window into that particular piece, and it's uh, it's a lot of Oh yeah, so then there's that strand, I'm trying to go faster, there's that strand of the technology but the, and then the politics, but the other thing that was going on simultaneously was my interest in the human voice. And, um, and it was kind of morphed because it was about women's voice and sort of the, um, the, you know, the cultural significance of women's voice and also this idea of the actual voice. So I, with all these combinations of things, I did this piece. You'll hear excerpt from towards the beginning, 
And some of the voices are mine, and some of them are different women that I have recorded. So we'll just listen to a bit of it. This secret light. This secret light hiding our heads. No one could speak. I did all No one could speak. 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 We were daughters of evil. Well, it was, kind of, it was referencing the Witchburn period, and it became, I became, that piece sort of went underground at the time um, on cassettes that were being circulated, and, and it became known as the Devil's Piece. <laughs> the Devil Piece. And I got to get all kinds of weird letters about it. <laughs> so, well, because, because, because there were these references to women being, you know, the Devil's gateway. And Mm -hmm. it, it comes a little bit later after all that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that piece has got me into a lot of hot water. Uh, even when I was a student at McGill, um, the, my colleagues, male colleagues, would rant and rave at me. <laughs> but, but anyway, <coughs> we won't go there. Um, so that's, I guess, oh my god, I forgot this was being videotaped. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, I kind of moved on from there. and. Um, then the next piece I'm going to play is uh, a piece, okay, so that was in the mid-80s, and uh, then I, I pursued my own, the development of my own voice, and the way I wanted to, to do that was, I did that through th theater, getting involved with a theater coach, music voice, music coach, and then I um, started getting involved in something called I don't even know how to define it, but it was kind of working with the invisible energetic fields of the, of the human being. And um, 
So I used to go to this woman who would do these, I have no idea what she was doing, but I would make these amazing sounds. And um, she had, um, yeah, so uh, I uh, decided that one day I was going to record the sounds that were coming out of me, and I didn't really know what was going to happen. So, But I then got this residency at University of California in Santa Barbara, and I went there, and I had this very detailed way of working with all these sounds, and I organized them into all these categories, and then I created this piece called Dream Spin, and it was ultimately, that was the very first piece that I did um, for A-Channel Spatialization, and Darren um, eventually I finished the composition there, and then I went to Banff, and we did. We I learned the um, what was that system called? That where you had to program everything, and it went. It was one of his first systems that he that he had, and uh, it was performed many times. And my favorite performance of that was at the in the outside in the west lawn of Gibraltar Point over on Toronto Island, and um, it was kind of like mixed with all the wind and the waves and. The birds and uh, airplanes. So, um, so this piece is, is all my own voice. So this was the first time I actually had the guts to use my own voice and the sounds that I was making and beginning to learn how to make with my body and my voice. So I, I, when I'm thinking about, you know, wh what's my relationship to electroacoustic music? It's really, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's the voice and it's the technology that allows me to kind of create these multiple layers and these multiple timbres and so really it's I, I feel split be in some ways between my loyalties to the voice and the body and and to this sort of in disembodied medium and uh, so maybe that's starting to come together a bit more but this this en enabled me to um, this particular piece enabled me to work with my own voice so we'll play a bit of that. I, won't pull, I won't play the whole thing but just a little bit It's called Dream Spin.
um, I think it was the beginning of me trying to figure out how to work with um, sound as a potent force of, 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 of the vibrational power of sound and the human voice and the body and really trying to figure out what that was all about, what, what really was going on there because I, I, I knew that there was something going on mostly from my own experience but I didn't really totally understand it. And so I started this exploration of that and um, as part of it, I decided I wanted to go to ancient sites in Crete and Malta and um, go back to a particular place called the Hypogeum, which is in Malta, which is an underground chamber that's at least 7,000 years old, and which has incredible acoustics and is designed so that um, there's a figurine that was found there. They call her the Sleeping Lady. And um, she's laying on her side. And um, But the idea is that she's symbolizing a form of what people call dream incubation. So there's something going on in the dream world and that sound is initiating this. So I wanted to go back, to go to those places and understand and experience really in my body what was going on with that. So I, I, I spent many, I, I don't know how many times I've been there, but in the hypogeum itself, it's, it's a crazy place. It's just you lose all sense of everything when you're in there. And um, so I had many opportunities to make sounds and to record. And um, and then I started working with this archetypal energy of the sounding, well, I call her the sounding dream woman, which is the, the version of the sleeping lady. But for me, it's this kind of, this energy of really understanding how sound can shift consciousness and sound can shift awareness and perception. And I still feel like I'm trying to figure out all that. Um, but this particular piece is, the, the, that I'll finish off with, is, is a recent piece that I is coming out in a CD that I, putting together, the music's basically all done. It was mixed in 5.1 surround sound with um, Hector, um, who works for NASA, and he helped me with that. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's my own voice, and um, working with this, this idea of this character, this sounding dream woman character, and her connection to ancient sound and ancient ways of understanding sound, and trying to bring this into this contemporary context and the other sounds. So it's multiple layered, but primarily it's kind of, it's a piece that I can actually perform live. Um, but what you'll hear is sort of the studio version of me doing the, the live track and then this other um, soundscape that I created using sounds that are recorded in it. So we'll just hear a little bit of it.
term that I forgot to mention earlier is electro vocal. It's something that uh, this musicologist friend of mine in Amsterdam used to, she wrote an article quite some time ago about my music, but she used that term and it's one that I like to kind of hang on to because it kind of combines both, both streams. So I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.